Welcome everyone to today's tax podcast where we are going to be talking about the North Carolina pass-through entity tax election. I'm Kathy Stanton. I'm a partner with Cherry Beckard. I lead the state and local tax practice. And with me today, I have Tony Conkle, who is an attorney and manager in our SALT practice, who knows uh, pretty much everything there is to know on pass-through entity tax elections. There's the bar to reach, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so there there have been many, many past year entity elections uh, that have been enacted within the past, mostly past year, but past two years. Um, so a little bit of background. The TCJA Tax Cuts and Jobs Act limited the state and local tax deduction that individuals can take on their itemized deductions schedule. And the limitation was $10,000 of state and local taxes. So a lot of people meet a good portion of this just through their property taxes. So you can imagine if you're a flow through, if you're, if you're an owner of a flow through entity that is highly profitable, you could be uh, limited severely in the ability to deduct state income taxes. Where if you are organized as a C corporation, all of those state income taxes would be deductible for federal tax purposes. So what we're looking at here with the pass-through entity tax elections are taking a non-deductible expense at the federal level and by imposing a tax at the pass-through entity level itself, it converts that non-deductible state income tax expense to a deductible state income tax expense at the federal level. Uh, federal um, highest rate is 37% at the individual level, so this could be could, could result in significant savings. Um, the IRS, said toward the end of 2020, had issued a notice uh, that basically sanctioned um, this approach. That yes, this generally works. However, it's not really authoritative guidance. They said that regulations would be forthcoming. However, no regulations have been issued and we're not expecting any anytime soon. So we have, we do have a bit of a stamp of approval from the IRS, uh, but it, it's definitely not as authoritative as we would like that, that to be. But that notice did open the doorway for numerous states and New York City to pass legislation in order to allow owners of pass-through entities to make an election to impose the income tax at the pass-through entity level, as opposed to that income tax liability being imposed at the individual level. So that's exactly what we're talking about, just making an election. Can I make election, tax at the entity level, get the deduction. <laughs> so there's a lot that's oversimplifying, and, and Tony can attest to that, uh, because there are a lot of nuances on whether you qualify, uh, whether it is beneficial, because it could harm certain taxpayers. Um, but there are, again, 29 jurisdictions now that have a pass through entity tax election. There are a few that have been proposed. Um, and New York City also is the first uh, local jurisdiction that has this election. So today, that's some background um, for uh, today's topic, which we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the North Carolina pass-through entity tax election. Uh, and Tony, I will let you uh, give us uh, what your viewpoint is and some thoughts and how the North Carolina entity pass-through entity election generally works. Uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so a little bit of background. This was established by North Carolina Senate Bill 105. It was enacted in November of 2021. So the pass-through entity election is first available for tax year 2022. Um, so for calendar year taxpayers, it'd be 20, you know, a tax year that begins January 1st, 22, or for a fiscal year taxpayer, any tax year that begins on or after January 1st, 22. Um, since then, uh, North Carolina passed uh, one piece of technical legislation, a bill that, you know, had a f tax measures in it, um, but just one other little thing in June 22, just to clarify, um, for uh, electing PTEs, um, just a, a little tweak to estimated payments um, since then, but otherwise that's uh, the two pieces of legislation that have kind of created this framework for North Carolina to um, join 
we'll say uh, 30 jurisdictions total right now, 29 states, New York City, the first local jurisdiction, um, and with a handful of other states um, that have introduced some legislation and, you know, in various states of uh, getting through their own general assemblies. Um, so this will be so this will be effective for tax like calendar year 2022, which means that tax year just ended. So all the extensions and tax returns that everybody's going to file for 2022, this is the first year that the election can apply, right? Yes, that okay. is correct. Yeah. Um, so uh, some of the basic mechanics here, uh, entities that are eligible would be partnerships or S corporations. Um, kind of following just uh, under the Internal Revenue Code, any tax rates at 1065 or 1120S filer. Um, North Carolina, though, has some pretty strict eligibility requirements for partnerships. Um, for S corporations, they really don't have any uh, of those ownership requirements that would um, otherwise like, prohibit the entity from electing because you know the federal rules, IRC 1361, kind of takes care of a lot of that um, just from from the outset, um, just because generally it's got to be individuals and in some very limited categories of trusts, you know, that can be S corp shareholders. Um, so for partnerships, um, a partnership uh, has to be 100% owned by individuals, estates, or limited categories of trusts described in IRC 13 or 1361 C2 or C6. Um, so North Carolina is another state where we've seen this in a few different pieces of legislation where they kind of, even for partnerships, reference the S-Corp shareholder ownership statute um, just to kind of shortcut some of these ownership limitations here. So if you could, but, be, an, so if you could be an owner of an S-Corp, um, and it, but it's just a partnership, you would qualify. Basically, they're looking at you have to be someone who it could own an S-Corp. Um, it, as an owner of a partnership. Otherwise, if you have tiered partnership or C-Corp right. ownership, you wouldn't qualify for the election. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's a pretty harsh mm -hmm. and very strict ownership yeah. requirement where if you just had a partnership with, you know, a 1% owner who was, you know, a C-Corp or another pastor entity, the entire entity is going to be disqualified from making the election. Um, so in tiered structures, you may just have to keep going up the tiers to find, you know, an entity that is otherwise eligible, but you know there could be some restructuring opportunities exactly. and things you can you know yeah. do there. But you know it may not be easy. But you know all hope may not be lost. Uh, yeah, just, but, and then it, even in restructuring, you have to get everybody, all the owners, to agree yeah. and your attorneys, and so it's not it's not always as easy as one would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> uh, generally, like in the base of income that this tax is going to be computed on. Uh, the approach North Carolina took isn't, you know, I would say one that at first not a lot of states were taking in their legislation, but, you know, in, lately we're seeing a little bit more of it from some of the later states that have enacted their own PTE tax regimes. And um, that is where you kind of like separate between the owners who are residents and non-residents of North Carolina. And so non-residents, it's that North Carolina apportioned income that this tax is going to be computed on. Um, However, for residents, that base of income is going to be unapportioned. It's that entire distributive share of income that, as a resident, they would be subject to tax on in North Carolina. Well, that looks like such a mismatch, right? You know, so you have yeah. two owners, 50% owners, but only 10% of the income is apportioned in North Carolina. The 150% owner, 50% of the whole income is going to be in the tax base, but the other owner, it's only, you know, 50% of the income times 10%. So you really have uh, a mismatch there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is just, you know, one approach that North Carolina took that not all states are doing. Um, some states, it's just going to be a portion of income for residents and non-residents. But I guess, as, you know, a measure of relief from the salt cap, it's, you know, we're looking at our own residents, right? Yeah, Who's the people yeah. voting for us, right? Yay exactly. for the resident! Yay for the so, residents! They get a bigger deduction. Yeah. Right. It may lead to some additional computation issues, and you know, thinking about it that way. But then again, if a resident, if you're taxed on this entire base of income, you know, that's a bigger pool of income that you can pay tax at the entity level, and you know, ultimately get that deduction, you know, by lowering your federal ordinary income. 
uh, by taking the selection. So what about those residents then that say it's a 100% North Carolina resident, right? So he gets to include just the whole entire income, say they're both, say partnership, they're both North Carolina residents. What about the other states then that they pay taxes to? Because if they're paying all of it to North Carolina, then they have a portion income to other states. How how does that work? Well, it's going to work out and flush itself out through the credit for taxes paid to other states mechanism that North Carolina and many other states would do for you know, income that's taxed in your resident state and to another state. Um, one interesting thing that North Carolina is doing, though, that I, I don't think any other state that I've come across yet is doing it this way, is um, for other states that also have PT elections. So how this would work is if the uh, the pastor entity elects in North Carolina and in the other state, it's actually the entity itself that claims that credit for taxes paid to other states on the residence portion of the, you know, the income the tax is computed on. And so the entity would, you know, the taxes that's computed on their ownership share is offset and reduced by claiming that credit for taxes paid to other states. So it's an interesting approach kind of that um, yeah. How, yeah. how North Carolina is doing it this way. But, you know, I, I guess from a compliance standpoint, um, so we'll discuss maybe in a few minutes here, North Carolina, we'll call like an income reduced method state where the, uh, you know, the owner of the past entity instead of getting a credit would just take a subtraction from income um, uh, on their individual return. So they're just going to take, as a resident, that entire subtraction of all the income from the pastor entity. They don't have to claim the credit for taxes paid to other states anymore. It makes things a lot easier, easier for the yeah. individual, right? Yeah. So it if might you're... shift some of that compliance burden, you know, because then the entity's got to, you know, substantiate and, you know, provide the attachments okay. to the return to claim that credit. Um, makes it easy for the owner, though. Yeah, and that's nice and clean as long as the entity is making past your entity elections in every other state that you have income. Right, right. right. But then you might not make an election in a state and the individual would still get a credit for that. They would, right. yeah. And and that just kind of follows the same, you know, same Typical. as it always has been, right? You know, yeah. if an individual files a non-resident individual return in the other state, they claim the credit for taxes paid to other states, yeah. the same as they always have. Um, but um, North Carolina, the tax is going to be computed on the North Carolina individual rate in effect for the tax year. So that's something, uh, as we see, like right now for me as a North Carolina resident, uh, just noticed, uh, you know, as our, our uh, income rate just changed a little bit for 2023, went from 4.99% to 4.75%. Yeah, I was going to so, say, yours is going backwards. Like going yeah, it's nice. Yeah. A few extra bucks, nice. you know, yeah, every yeah. month in the paycheck. All right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I like that. Just one thing, you know, keep an eye on, um, you know, and, and that's going to be reduced, I think, down to 3.99% over the course of. And I would assume that the credit that either the individual or the entity gets, the credit's not going to be able to be larger than the North Carolina tax rate. So if you're at a 10% California rate, you're only going to get that 4.7% credit. Yeah. 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 Uh, Pretty typical how a lot of, you know, most states we competed the same way, you know, computed under both states and typically the one that's the lower tax rate is usually yeah. where the credit's going to be capped at. Um, but how North Carolina uh, kind of gets this benefit to the owner of the past serenity, states kind of have two different approaches here. Um, the most straightforward one is the credit method, we call it. And that's just where the entity pays the tax, the lex pays the tax at the entity level. And the owner, based on their ownership share, just gets a pro rata cr- like tax credit passed down to them on their K. Um, that they claim on their individual return for their share of that tax that was paid at the entity level. So um, they still have to they still have to file a return in many states to take that credit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, and that'd be for residents and for non-residents too. Yeah. Um, you know, and North Carolina is one state. Um, you know, some states still require non-residents to still file a return. North Carolina, they say, well, if you don't have any other sources of income, if you're a non-resident, the tax has already been paid. You don't have to file a non-resident return if That's you don't good. want to. Residents, yeah. you still, you know, you're always still going to file that return. Yeah. Um, North Carolina, the approach they'd take instead of a credit method um, is an, we call it an income reduced method state. So rather than, you know, getting a credit for the tax that was paid at the entity level, they take a subtraction 
against their taxable income for the income that was taxed at the entity level. So in a credit method state, you know, the individual would still compute, uh, take the taxable income, compute their individual income tax, and then offset it with a credit. Here, it would be you would take that subtraction and say if you didn't have other sources of income, you know, you would just have no taxable income remaining to compute that individual income tax on. Okay. Um, in a pure example with, you know, no other sources of income, it kind of gets you to that same bottom line tax due number after credits, mm -hmm. like zero, you know, um, yeah. just a different way of getting to it. Um, but that's just another approach that North Carolina t took that not all states, you know, would have followed. So and why Again, would, one of many things where it, all yeah. these states are just so different in the approaches that they take. And why wouldn't these states follow a model act approach, right? That'd I mean, wouldn't it be nice? Do. I mean, in so many different areas. Now, granted, I've built a 37 year career in state tax and it's based on the complexities and the differences. But, um, you know, I, I'm I feel very strongly that, hey, I could do something else if we made this all uniform and easy, uh, because it just seems like there's just always added complexity. We were hoping that most of the states would adopt like a model act and mm -hmm. be similar. So you learn one set of rules and it happens or that's the way it works in all states. But unfortunately, as Tony, you're indicating, I mean, every state can be different. Every yeah. state can be different on qualification, can be different on how, whether you get a credit or a deduction. Um, can you talk just, we only have probably a, a couple minutes left. Can you talk about um, when you would not want to make a pass-through entity tax deduction? Because it seems like, hey, we're going to convert all this state tax to a deductible state tax that sound, or sounds awesome for federal tax purposes. Is there any situation where we just wouldn't want to do that? Because we want to make sure people aren't just kind of willy-nilly making elections if it's going to hurt them. Right. I mean, probably one of the biggest issues to look out for here would just be making sure that, you know, who are the owners? Where where do they reside in what states and do they have an ability to claim that credit for taxes paid to other yeah. states because yeah. you got to watch out. i mean you know it's not so much of an issue when so many other states have now elected their own regimes and they want to play nice with other states for entity level taxes but you know it, it kind of you know creates an issue where you got to look into it a lot closer where it's like well the individual isn't actually paying that income tax anymore. It's not like they're filing that non-resident return and themselves, you know, uh, paying the non-resident tax or participating in a composite return. Um, in a piece of guidance issued by the North Carolina DOR, they've taken a position for partnerships only that um, if the partnership doesn't elect the North Carolina PT tax, but they do elect in some other states, they have a position in this guidance that they issued saying that that North Carolina resident can't claim that credit for taxes paid to other states on that entity level PT tax in other states. Um, it's not the case for S corporations because North Carolina just kind of already already had in their statutes previously. Um, for some states that just you know didn't automatically recognize a federal S election like New Jersey and New York um, that might have taxed an S corporation like a C corporation before. Um, so you know the way that North Carolina's mechanism is set up, you know the way that that credit is claimed, kind of like funneled through the entity, you know when they elect the North Carolina PT tax, um, they're just saying that there's you know. Uh, no statute of authority for you know the resident to claim that credit when they don't or don't elect the North Carolina PT tax. Which I would say there's statutory basis to actually take the deduction. So that's kind of a questionable. They actually yeah. raised a question. We didn't think there were any issues there. So um, I think there's still a statutory basis for taking the credit. But yeah, it's an interesting issue. I think it gets so confusing that even the departments, I think, uh, get a little confused with that. So so what I'm hearing is you want to make sure the owners of the pass-through entities are, are either going to get the income removed from their tax return, if it was already taxed at the entity level, or they get a credit for the tax that was paid at the entity level so that they're net zero, like they're not paying any additional tax. It's just right. remove the tax from the individual level to the entity level. But if they don't, then they actually pay in more than one tax. They're paying two state 
taxes on the same income. So that would definitely be probably the biggest pitfall. Yeah, we don't want this to go the other way. We're trying, you know, like yeah, we're not trying to hopefully save money. Right, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, we're not trying to create a create a problem. But I think that just goes to the complexities of each of these, and and that's probably about um, the attention span we have of our listeners (laughs) with regard to the detail mechanics of how these pass through entity tax elections work. But I hope this was helpful uh, for many so that they could get some additional information on North Carolina a specific pass-through entity election. Um, but certainly we're always here. Cherry Becker, contact your uh, contact at Cherry Becker in the tax department or us in the SALT group. Uh, we'd be happy to help you with your state uh, pass-through entity tax elections at the various states to make sure that you get as much uh, benefit as you can at the federal level, especially if you have a huge amount of income, you're selling a business, but if you have lots of income, you do not want to overlook these elections. You, It's really worth the time uh, to look to see whether they would apply or not. So yeah, especially if you're in one of these states where you can, it's your unapportioned, you know, for a resident, yeah. you know, that full amount of income. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tony, for your time. I appreciate it today and your expertise. Uh, and we will sign off on today's tax podcast. But thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen. Have a great day.